Docket 1325, an ordinance promoting equity in the City of Boston contracts. Uh, the matter was sponsored by my two colleagues to both my left and right, City Council President Michelle Wu and City Councilor at Large Diana Presley, referred to the committee on October the 18th of 2017. Docket 1325 proposes to amend CBC Chapter 4, Section 4, promoting minority and women-owned business enterprises in the City of Austin to further promote equity in the City of Austin contracts. These provisions include the creation of a supplier diversity program which will be responsible for outreach to uh, WMBEs regarding city needs and contracting processes, including those for supplies and services, construction, public works, and design services, directing any and all RFPs that the city releases as well as the evaluation process for such RFPs to include WMBE participation among key criteria, and requiring uh, com 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 compilation of the following information from city departments and central procurement for quarterly reports to the mayor and to the city council. Uh, joining us today on behalf of the administration is Carolyn Crockett, who is the policy director of economic development, and Kevin Coyne, purchasing agent for the city of Boston. And this time, I'd like to turn it over to my colleagues, uh, the lead sponsors, for their initial comments and then get into a discussion. So, Chair recognizes City Council President Michelle Wu. Good morning. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you to my co sponsor, Councilor Presley, and, and to you both for joining us. Um, th as you know, this follows from the hearing that we had earlier in the year and um, the good work that your offices have been doing and trying to really make sure that Boston's wealth and um, opportunities are shared among all of our residents and um, particularly in terms of building up opportunities for wealth creation in our neighborhoods. Um, so this first proposal is, is certainly just that, a proposal. Uh, so really looking to get your feedback. We wanted to, I, and Councilor Presley will, will um, speak for herself, but I, and part of the goal for my eyes was to make sure that we are putting some real teeth in the actions that we can take at the city level, and particularly this provision uh, for transparency, but um, also to make sure that we are actively requiring solicitation of bids by MWBEs, um, to, for me, would be a, a real step that we could take that would make a difference right away. Thank you. Thank you, Council President. Chair, recognize City Councilor Diana Presley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, uh, Councilor Wu, uh, for your, your leadership and partnership on this. And um, I second everything that you said. Uh, and um, would, again, looking forward to this, uh, this discussion to better understand uh, from the city. Uh, certainly, there is an expressed commitment around um, uh, the intention behind this, um, but what is the city's um, commitment? and what is your capacity uh, to implement this, to actualize these uh, values around um, inclusion and equitable access to wealth building um, and job creation in the city of Boston. Um, things we already know, um, but certainly I, you know, I would say in the Globe Spotlight series continue to be uh, soberingly crystallized and reinforced for all of us. Uh, and so I appreciate Councilor Rule using um, uh, the verb actively you know, so, so what are we doing? Um, I'm also, so want to know if, if, you, if we have buy-in from you to do this, if you have the capacity to implement this, what that requires on a staffing level, and what, if anything, do you need from a, you know, budgetary or fiscal standpoint? And then finally, um, you know, how does this uh, work within the context of the MBE executive order that's already been signed? Um, and then what is the status of the RFP? And I, I do want to, you know, thank the city for putting out that RFP around the disparity study. Um, but we, you know, the, the, the study will only confirm what we already know to be true. Um, and while we're waiting for that, you know, it's important that we are moving with deliberate speed um, to, um, to see this actualized so that we can begin to move the needle. Thank you, Councilor Pressing. Chair yeah. recognizes in any order. Sure. Can you guys choose? Um, well, thank you for having us here today, for sure. I'm joined by uh, my colleague, Kevin Coyne, and, and these are, are vexing and concerning issues for us uh, that brings us back into this conversation. So Chairman Flaherty, thank you for uh, convening us. Uh, Madam President, thank you for your leadership here, and Councilor Presley for your continued leadership and perseverance on, on bringing out the points around accountability uh, transparency for sure and, and asking the critical questions around capacity building and, and, and budget needs. These are, are essential points and appreciated that uh, we have this forum to discuss these issues more publicly. Uh, so equity in public procurement is an essential strategy for ensuring uh, shared wealth. 
uh, building and shared prosperity in the, in the city of Boston. This has certainly been a vexing issue for us to think more carefully about our contracting and procurement uh, policies overall as well as implementation and so we did appreciate the opportunity to be before this body previously previously this year in March I believe and so um, again coming back to this conversation just speaks very clearly and deliberately to the council's commitment um, and also is an opportunity for to, us to speak to the mayor's uh, shared commitment in making sure that there is there's policy there's practice and there's ongoing commitment to making sure that we can deliver on uh, equity and, and procurement. So I just want to share a couple of points in terms of what we have been doing, what we've been up to since we last met, um, and also look forward to the opportunity to actually engage in a, in a, a, a very uh, vibrant dialogue around this, this ordinance before us. So there is absolute support and agreement on the need for uh, a very strong and stronger uh, supplier diversity program as well as policy and, and procurement goals that can support that programming. So we do not disagree on the identification of that issue, nor the, neither do we disagree on the need to have a stronger program in place. So um, again, thank you for bringing our attention to this issue and look forward to really delving in here. So uh, since we were last before the council, we have continued our, uh, continued our work to deliver contracting outreach and workshops. We had a large workshop in, uh, I believe it was April of this year at the bowling building where we had a, uh, more than 200 small businesses, small business attendees who came um, and were able to meet directly with procurement officers from more than a couple dozen departments who uh, at that time were actually engaging in, in matchmaking, if you will. So uh, department liaisons were sharing bid opportunities and contract opportunities on the spot and new businesses uh, who had not contracted with the city as well as some existing business relationships were able to understand what were the new opportunities. Um, in addition to that, we have been working with more than 30 uh, liaisons that we've identified from departments with the highest procurement spend. Those liaisons help us have a direct link to departments um, and give us a sense of what are upcoming RFP or bid opportunities. So uh, an, an essential strategy for actually making a direct uh, gateway to not only opportunities but leadership in departments that we know are spending. Uh, since we've met with you, we've also launched a small business center in Mattapan in East Boston. This strategy from the Office of Small Business Development um, and the Mayor's Office of Economic Development have been uh, essential uh, outreach and programming opportunities to identify entrepreneurs across the city who want to start businesses as well as uh, individuals who have a business that may want to contract with the city. So for each of these kinds of opportunities, we've gone to the neighborhoods, on the ground uh, working with about 20 different partners from across the city who want to work on building the capacity mm -hmm. of these businesses. But we have also been very uh, intent on making sure that all of these businesses across the neighborhoods know about uh, contracting opportunities with, with the city. So very important for us to make sure, again, that not only can people uh, do business with the city if they come to City Hall, but that we're going to get out into the neighborhoods and make that information clear uh, to everyone. So I also want to recognize Councilor Asabi George, who is in my peripheral vision and has snaked in on us. So I'm happy to see you. Uh, in addition to the small business centers, we have also developed um, a diversity and inclusion language for all City of Boston RFPs. This language has been uh, an important breakthrough for us because it is the, the first time that we've been able to come to uh, standardization of language in terms of how uh, city departments reach out to vendors, getting language in there around diversity for firms and MNWBEs as well as workforce participation goals. So we're very pleased with that and are, have pleased to, are pleased to report that there are departments who um, who are actively actually adopted that language and use that for the, their selection methods. In addition, uh, we have continue, as we continue to work to lead by example for the city itself through city departments and outreach there, we've also been working with private partners and developers to address disparity in economic opportunities for local people of color, uh, women, um, as well as MNWBE firms. So a good example of this is the MOU that we've entered into with Winthrop Square Development um, and sets, it sets participation goals for M and WBEs as well as expanded workforce goals going beyond the existing uh, BRJP requirements. So that is a, another example of trying to expand uh, inclusion and uh, 
equity into the private space. And there needs to be more of that work, but it's really important that on that particular deal that there's language for that. Um, I'll wrap up uh, by saying that uh, based on the, I guess actually back to your point, Councillor Presley, in terms of the disparity study, which you all know that we have just uh, uh, released the RFP for that. We are now actually in the final stages of a final selection for a consulting team for the disparity study. It, it is an essential piece of work that is before us because it, it allows us to delve more deeply into what is the into the data that we have available to make an assessment, a legal assessment uh, based on the status of disparity in the city and will give us the basis for thinking more deliberately and specifically about goals that have a, a race and gender based uh, criteria. So the disparity study, we look forward to uh, launching that in the beginning of the new year and uh, look forward to the findings there. I don't disagree with uh, Councillor Presley's assessment that even on the face of looking at uh, who is available and who's been utilized in the city of Boston, that, that speaks anecdotally for sure to what we would recognize as an economic disparity. What the disparity study itself will give us is, is is the, the legal basis to proceed with this kind of policy analysis. And so we welcome that work. In fact, Kevin and I are on the selection committee there and are looking forward to, to wrapping up that process. So again, thank you for the opportunity to discuss uh, this important and, and vexing matter and also to roll up our sleeves actually and get into the details of how to make this uh, strong, sound, um, and, and, and right with deliberate speed here. Thank you, Carolyn. Anything to add Thank to you, that? Carolyn. Thank you for having me back, um, councils. I appreciate being here today. I just wanted to update you a little bit. Um, my office, as you're aware, is really responsible for the procurement of goods within the city. Um, a lot of where, you know, we would be able to provide more opportunities within the community of the citizens of Boston is relating to services. But there was a change in the threshold of procurement law right. that the city adopted um, in the spring of this year. Previously, it was $10,000 to $35,000. Um, was that it was called a written quote contract that threshold has bumped up to fifty thousand and now anything over fifty thousand dollars is a publicly advertised bid so with that threshold change it, it allows us to reach out to more um, of the small and local businesses offices within Boston we work with the um, the office of small and local businesses on their database and we reach out to vendors within Boston within that category Anything over 50000 is still a publicly advertised bid, and it is open up to you know, anybody within the city that has access to be able to bid on those items. But we actively you know, search out in Boston um, businesses at all times. And uh, so a quick question on that one, Kev. So those aren't for design services, that those are for, that no, goes up to 50 on? Design services would be something that would be created by the individual department requesting those services. Because okay. we, uh, according to Master on Laws, um, the design services, whenever an, any department of the city announces contracting opportunities for professional services like architecture and engineering for any amount less than 25000 <clears throat> the city shall seek proposals from at least one uh, MBE or one WBE. So, um, and that's based on, I guess, the 2003 disparity right. study. That was the last study we did was 2003. Right. Yes. Any idea why we haven't done anything from 2003 till, and again, it's not on your watch, but do we have any historical perspective as to why we didn't conduct anything after 2003? So, two questions for me. One, one question actually is to clarify this threshold because yeah. it has increased since then. And so in this, in this new, in this proposed ordinance mm -hmm. here, would that also be amended to reflect the new threshold? Or, would that, that was just a general question that yeah, I had. Yeah, through the chair and all through the lead sponsors, is that sort of the goal? Of yeah, I mean, we end up citing the statute, so um, I think it's already, because we're citing the state statute and that's what was amended or adopted, I think it's already, but we're happy to, to we'll check happy to clarify okay. to match that. Yep. And are we, yep. should we be on the same statute as, we're talking Master General Laws, Chapter 7, Section 38A yep. and a half, dash 380, which yep. is design services, mm -hmm. that would be architects and engineers. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, just want to make sure we're, we're talking about the same. Yes, Kevin sure. mentioned those those types of contracts, and then yep. I had a question on these. And then to Carolyn, um, you had mentioned. Uh, so I, I go back to I, as of January of 2014, there was an application that allowed for certification of small, local uh, minority women-owned businesses yep. in the city of Boston. So then you had indicated a little while ago that um, there was a large workshop where over 200 businesses. So how many, how many applications do you have on file 
and then what's the process by which we do sort of touch base, check-ins, how do we communicate with the businesses that are on file? And businesses that are certified? Yes. The city in particular? Yeah, yes. Off the top of your head, how many businesses, as of we speak, how many of them are certified? Yep. Uh, right now, what's our, our communication with yeah, them? our directory is about uh, 600 businesses uh, that have been certified with the city, and you can be certified with us as uh, small and local, as uh, MBE or Minority Business Enterprise, WBE, or business, women business enterprise, or we also recognize veteran-owned businesses uh, based on the mayor's executive order in 2015. So our, our database reflects that diversity of certifications. Uh, certification lasts for about three years, uh, and then at the end of that, certification is, is renewed, subject to renewal. Uh, and uh, we also have a, a cross partnership with Governor Baker's Supplier Diversity Office to allow for cross certification with the state. So the ongoing communication with those businesses is actually a weekly uh, 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 sort of email blast that we send out to that list, letting them know of available contracting and bid opportunities with the city. We also, at the, the workshop that you referenced, Councilor Flaherty, we also let them know of ongoing um, and, and regular workshopping op opportunities that we have as well as networking. So the idea is to be able to, one, identify businesses that have the capacity, the wherewithal, um, and the willingness to contract with the city as well as the state and potentially federal, um, and then also to build up the capacity that they have to, uh, to do business in the city in general and to build up the network, quite frankly, among those businesses. So. Um, it's been really important to have a, a, close, a closer relationship with the state because that allows us to recognize um, a larger catchment of businesses, um, even in the greater Boston area. So the state has about 1,000 or 1,500 uh, businesses that are certified that can, can constitute also Boston as well. And then when you're saying renewal, so is it are they annuals? It's, it's uh, annual three years. Every three years. Yeah. Gotcha. And then um, the new disparity uh, study, you expect that to begin when, in the beginning of the year, most likely. Right. And then um, how, long do you, how long do you anticipate that process taking? Sure. The, the study itself, the scope of it has been broken into two parts. Uh, phase one is estimated to be about a four-month process, a four-month period of, of again, re reviewing and assessing the data that we have in the city in terms of businesses that have been utilized by the city of Boston. Um, that, that period will also give us an understanding of, of what would be the basis for a larger disparity study and what would be the design. Um, and then uh, assuming that we're able to move forward with the full design and a, and a deeper dive into the study itself, we anticipate the study to take about 12 to 14 months. Okay. And so I think that wraps up until about sort of 18 months or so. At the end of that time, then we would be able to look at the results of the disparity study and, and, and understand with much more specificity and focus the basis for a supplier diversity program, perhaps not unlike what's presented here in the ordinance. Gotcha. And then within the 600 businesses, is there a breakdown of the different types of businesses? Are they all sort of one I sector? I can get that greater yeah. detail, too. Just yeah, absolutely. I, wanted, I mean, 600, it's, yep. it seems like it's a good, and solid number. And you can sort that. The idea is you right. can also sort that by what types of business, right. what kind of service exactly. they provide. Yeah. And so we, t we intend that to be a, a tool for department right. heads and leadership right. as they're thinking about their procurement needs. The directory is a way for them right. to get a better right. sense of who can Would fulfill those needs. I'd love to see that breakdown and then also where sure. the outreach needs to take place in yep. terms of what, what types of products and what types of services and where are we deficient uh, or maybe where there are some businesses that we can connect folks with. So Absolutely. Chair recognizes Council President Wu. Thank you. Um, so this is great. It really sounds like a lot of what you are doing um, aligns with the goals that um, Councilor Presley and I had laid out with the ordinance. So um, I just consulted with our, our uh, deputy council back here, and um, it would make perfect sense to bump the 25,000 threshold up to 50,000 to match the changes that you've adopted. Um, do you have any other particular feedback about this? It, a lot of it seems to codify what you're doing. I did have a, a question with uh, that same area where mm -hmm. it, it seems like this ordinance in, in, re in referencing professional services speaks explicitly, explicitly to architecture and engineering. And I was wondering if there might be an opportunity to, to expand that 
focus in the, the mayor's uh, executive order in 2016 based on some of the disparity that we found in the last disparity study. The definition of professional services was expanded to, um, to move even beyond just design to consider potentially marketing, accounting, legal services, other types of professional services that businesses in the city might provide. So uh, we were wondering if the council might consider a more expanded uh, definition of professional services again beyond those design areas. Mm -hmm. So I would, rec absolutely, I would recommend then it read professional services, we would delete the parentheses architecture and engineering um, so professional services for an amount less than 50,000, the city shall, shall seek proposals from at least one MBE or WBE firm whose professional services qualify as such under the city's most recently conducted disparity study. And the reason we left that kind of vague with, without referencing 2003 was anticipating any future changes that this would then hopefully continue to grow um, as the disparity study finds what we suspect it will find. Um, so that would, that would broaden that to match whatever um, the current state of the city's um, disparities are, are as recognized. Um, any other comments on that section in particular? No, I think that's great, thank you. In the next section on, so this would kind of address the diversity language piece that you also mentioned, Carolyn. Um, do you think this accurately reflects what the departments and agencies have adopted? Um, yeah, I actually have copies of the oh, great. RFP language for the council that we can share. Um, happy to do that. Let's Perfect. See. Because we could even make this section a little more specific too if you wanted to include the specific provisions that your language um, recommends. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Also just wanna, uh, before I forget, just wanna pick up on a typo in section four. Uh, it should read the provisions of this ordinance, not this section. Oops, yes. The provisions of this ordinance are severable, and if any provision or portion thereof should Thank be held you. to be unconstitutional or otherwise invalid by any court of competent jurisdiction, such unconstitutionality or invalidity shall not affect the remaining provisions which remain in full force and effect. So we just let the record reflect that we're making a change to section four. Thank you. Great. Um, and then in terms of the last, the sort of the bottom, section three, the bottom of that second page, um, is this the type of reporting that you all already do? Um, are there other things you would want to add to that? All right. Let's check Total this. dollars expended on procurement contracts, number and type of contracts, um, breakdown of demographics, et cetera. Yes, we did take a close look at this to see, in fact, what is the, uh, what is it that we're able to track or tracking now, and we've done quite a bit of work in this area, uh, thanks to our, our colleagues in the auditing department and do it um, as well. And it, it looks like that we have the capacity uh, to begin uh, tracking Great. these areas more closely. So I'm sorry for the hesitation. I just wanted to be very no, precise no, no. with the language here. Um, but it, it's great, and again, to, to your earlier point around transparency, uh, Madam President, I think it's it's really exciting uh, to think about what it means to to actually track internally, but to share more publicly mm -hmm. what these uh, the, these data points uh, communicate because it's important and it speaks exactly to uh, I think the larger mission, obviously, to a uh, strong supplier diversity program is to be able to be able to show the businesses themselves that this is this is possible that their success that's there and that only actually increases the number of folks who are willing to do business with the city. So yes, we, uh, we would be able to generate quarterly reports that reflect uh, these areas of, of data information and procurement. Great. Um, okay, any other feedback on the specific language of the ordinance? Looks good. Okay, so I had a few um, other questions just based good. on your comments. Um, so so wonderful to hear about the contracting workshop um, and the 200 businesses that have been part of that, now part of the outreach. Uh, one question that we have gotten over and over again is that the sort of schedule of which contracts become available f through which departments right. is not all aligned. Um, right. So is there a, do you have sort of a master schedule now? If someone were to ask tomorrow, you know, hmm. how do I know when the next available opportunity is to bid on this type of contract? 
could is there something you could hand over and say that says you know uh, public works has these contracts ex expiring in 2019 20 2021 20, right um, you know BTD has these etc right currently there is not but this is a conversation that we have had internally about how to map that out we mm -hmm. had a, a meeting with uh, some of the procurement liaisons uh, the week before last, and we're, we're the, the point of the meeting was to get to this actual outcome, Great. which is what would it mean to be able to show specifically what the calendar is around particular RFPs and bids that are upcoming, uh, particularly for, well, there, I think there'd be two reasons for that. Obviously, one is to allow businesses to be able to begin to project their needs, mm -hmm. but also it gives us a planning opportunity to think about other types of workshops or capacity mm -hmm. building opportunities we could put in place so folks are ready for that. So um, we're not there yet, but I think also, uh, I think that is important work for us to, uh, to highlight and prioritize. Great, because the, the website, the portal as it is, is a perfectly transparent snapshot of what's available right now, right. but I think the next step is to kind of get to, okay, over the next year, over the next three years right. as everything um, turns over, what's available. Right. And, and the tracking piece would help with that too as we're putting all that together retroactively, we'd then be able to look forward with it. Um, and then, um, okay, so we talked about that. Oh, and then I just wanted to ask a quick question on the disparity study. So we've been talking about the disparity study in this context and in terms of expanding the executive order um, and the potential to establish race and gender based uh, goals or, or thresholds. Mm -hmm. Is this also linked to the linkage conversation that we had previously as well? Because I know when we were talking about whether the city would be able to go back, and this is Councilor Flaherty's initiative, to go back and recover some of the linkage money that was not, um, basically not, well, that was lost as we didn't update the mm -hmm. numbers as we were able to, um, that in order to do more than just the inflation, inflation indexed increase, we'd have to have some study or nexus study to be able to do that at the state level. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that baked into this RFP as well? I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with those uh, conversations and, and the details there, but I'd have to confer, I okay. think, uh, internally with the rest of the team to, to get more feedback on that. So Got it's it. a great question, and um, I'd love to follow up with you. Okay, perfect. And maybe there is opportunity then, since we're still in the um, early stages, to think about establishing that basis for that initiative. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is City Councilor Ayanna Presley. I thank my colleagues for their pointed questions. <laughs> Doesn't leave too much for me, um, but, um, but but that's fine. Again, many of the questions uh, that I had uh, have been asked and answered. Um, just just a couple of uh, just uh, questions I have just for more context. Could you tell me how many procurement officers we have? I'm just curious as to, hmm. you know, again, as we think about implementation of something, you know, all these institutions are, are run by people mm -hmm. and just want to make sure since we know that every, uh, every ordinance, every law is only as good as its enforcement, again, I just want to make sure that, you know, uh, culturally and in terms of the implementation, mm -hmm. that there is an expectation, you know, top down, um, and that procurement officers are aware of these changes and are being intentional, yeah. um, mm -hmm. you know, in their outreach right. um, uh, to uh, the line of questioning from uh, the chair and also um, the lead sponsor on this. On the uh, contracting workshop, that's something that we just hear all the time. She was referencing the schedules, but you know, it's a challenge for us in government. There's great work happening, but again, how do we connect people? Right. And the more that we do that, I think the more we'll bolster people's confidence in the integrity of the process, yeah. where they will be more inclined mm -hmm. to apply because they won't be under the impression that um, it's more of a pro forma exercise than, it, than a, a real equitable opportunity. Absolutely, absolutely, so. for sure. So that's my question. How, I don't know how many departments actually have spend, and then how many procurement officers we have, and then how are they informed of these changes? Yeah. So I think overall the city may be between 60 and 75 within the departments that would be responsible for some level of procurement. They may not all be called procurement officers. In some of the smaller departments, they could be, you know, people could be managing multiple things. And the communication usually occurs, you know, a couple times a year. It's usually, you know, sponsored with auditing and myself. It definitely happens, um, you know, at the, you, around the close of the year. You know, sometime May or June, there's usually an update. And then periodically throughout the years, there's uh, communications that go out to that group as a whole, um, you know, as it relates to contracting and, you know, whether it's changes in the system or things like that. Um, 
In addition, uh, to get back to Council Wu's uh, point regarding the transparency, the city has what's called the city record, which is you know kind of an older document, which is a PDF that's put on the city website. We've been working with Do It to automate that uh, process, right. and that will be very similar to the way the public notice is handled now for city council. And what that will do when when those get automated, it would give us more of the ability to be able to query you know all of the contracts that are done. When do they expire? When are they up again? So it will give us a lot more of the flexibility to be able to report on the things that you might be looking for that we're somewhat, you know, takes us a little bit longer to do now. And we should have that probably, I would say, probably by the end of the first quarter of uh, the 2018. That and how do you up. manage and retain the list of the 600, um, you know, folks that you've been able to cultivate through the workshops since you said you communicate with them fairly regularly? Mm -hmm. Is that just um, an email list or a listserv? Sure, the, the email list for sure, um, and we do share the Boston City record with this list uh, okay. weekly because there's an update there. But I think the idea is is really building a network amongst these folks. So in addition to the emails, trying to get folks to come to additional events and workshop opportunities. So uh, that's been a really deliberate part of the program building strategy behind the small business center. So well, please do let us know how we can support. Yeah. you know, engaging our platforms. You know, for we do very much want to continue to be a partner, you know, yeah. in this way, because um, I think we're getting at, you know, several issues. So one is, you know, um, access to the opportunity, the transparency about it exists, mm -hmm. about it existing. And then the other issue is um, um, folks in city government saying we can't find, <laughs> you know, who's certified, who's you know. Right. So right. by you're having that list of 600 and continuing to build upon that, you know, hopefully it allows us to get it, right. that as well. Right. And, and Councilor Presley, I do appreciate the question that you're raising around the individual procurement uh, agent or point person in the departments because we have found that to be really important to identify that person and have ongoing discussion there as well. So that's been a, a new part of our strategy this year, but very helpful because I think uh, the, the procurement process for departments is very decentralized and so some of this conversation and some of the efforts and some of what Kevin and I have been doing is is an attempt to standardize what is a process that happens in, in, in many different places at different times. So appreciate that part of the discussion Excellent. and recognizing that issue as well. Excellent. Yeah. And um, you know, not to uh, to be the skunk of the picnic in any way, but you know, it's my recollection that with the last disparity study, um, you know, that uh, that study uh, said that there was no disparity, right? right? right. Um, and so, you know, here we are. Um, so I, I just, uh, right. you know, want to make sure that we have a commitment that regardless of what the findings are, I know in many ways we do see that as um, giving us the legal basis. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you've been very, uh, there's been a great due diligence in, in the selecting, um, you know, in the rollout of this RFP and, and uh, that you're bringing all of what has happened in the past in, into consideration right. for right. this current process, right. but just um, that regardless of what those findings are, um, that we're still going to advance in this way because, again, we know that the disparity exists even anecdotally. Right. Is that fair? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. No question. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Agreed. Thank you. Chair sure, Hernandez, City Councilor Anissa Osabi George, thank, thank you for your patience. <laughs> thank you, and thank you, Chairs, and thank you to the lead sponsors. It's um, certainly um, good that we're here and great to hear from the two of you. I'm curious, um, not so much as about the details in the ordinance, because I think the lead sponsors have got that under control. Um, would you just share a little bit more information about the small business centers? I, I know you said Mattapan and Eastie, but can you talk a little bit about the hours and what the experience is of an individual uh, that goes into one of those locations? Sure, absolutely. Uh, and thank you for the question. So uh, essentially the, the idea of the small business center comes out of the mayor's uh, citywide small business plan. And when the plan was uh, launched in 2016, one of the main things that was identified was the fact that many small business owners across the city were not uh, aware of other uh, business service organizations that could support them and were not aware of what the, the range of city supports and services that were available to them. So we found that there are about 250 business service organizations that support small businesses in the city of Boston. And most uh, small business owners could name one, maybe two or three. And so that showed that there was a real disconnect between, again, what business owners needed and what was available to them. So the Small Business Center was conceived as a way of bringing business support organizations directly to 
uh, small business owners and also making a city of Boston staff, uh, departments, resources available to folks all free for sure. And that there would be a way to move through different neighborhoods. So first neighborhood being Mattapan, uh, we, we found that having a, a nine week series of workshops that were high impact uh, workshops that were offered by our partners. So SCORE, uh, SBA, uh, LISC, uh, different partners around the city, and that there were networking events there. And that a big part of it, again, was connecting people to resources that are available to the, uh, that they didn't know about, that were available, that were free, uh, letting folks have an opportunity to network, and honestly allowing the city of Boston a way to really think about uh, our pipeline of businesses that are able to be um, showcased on our directory, but also this, con this conversation around contracting. For Mattapan, as you know, the, the need there in particular to really support folks who want, it, want to establish businesses in the food-based food space or a restaurant that was a clear uh, focus there. We were there for uh, nine weeks on Thursdays, essentially in the evening. And so basically about four or five hours where staff would show up and be in the neighborhood. Similarly in East Boston, um, in East Boston, one of the things that we wanted to focus on was allowing uh, small business owners, many of whom were in the, in the the actually in the food space, um, to think about how to grow their businesses, but also to give uh, business owners there an opportunity to explore worker co-ops. Um, and cooperative business models for their businesses, which there was a large interest and demand there. So what we've done is try to, folk, to tailor some of the offerings uh, of the Small Business Center to what we know to be the needs and or strengths of the neighborhoods. Uh, the next rollout will be in Roxbury in the spring, a similar model of an eight or nine week series with about 20 different business service organization partners who are on hand to uh, provide technical assistance, um, even information around access to capital. We've had some great collaboration with folks from uh, Boston, uh, Boston Private Bank, as well as Axion, uh, as well as, uh, again, other folks who are in the capital space. So again, trying to make these resources available outside of the hall and really get into the neighborhood to understand what business owners and entrepreneurs need. So this isn't an office that is it open nine to five? It's been a pop-up series, yeah. And that's been the question, actually, uh, about whether or not this would have a more permanent location. So about 20 or so years ago, the city did have a small business center that had a, a more stationary presence in a neighborhood. And there were real pluses and minuses with that. And so we're trying to think through uh, the, the opportunity to have a more permanent location versus a, a, a kind of a, a roving uh, presence. And so what people have responded to, and the response has been very strong in the neighborhoods, is the opportunity to network with other businesses and to connect directly to providers who can help folks think through what else they need, whether it's uh, technical assistance for uh, for marketing or for thinking about legal issues in their business businesses. We have a, a great partnership with the business clinic at Northeastern and there are a bunch of law students who have been a part of this discussion. So um, there's been great response on the ground. In fact, uh, we've, we've generated a bunch of different surveys through the neighborhoods and the, the, one of the number one questions that comes back to us has been, when will you be back? Will there be more? Can you have more hours? Can there be more? What's, what's next? And so trying to take that kind of questioning and use that as a way to build the network. So it isn't just, we're in East Boston, we leave, then you figure out something else, we're in Mattapan. So the partners that we work with specifically have made ongoing commitments to those neighborhoods. For example, in East Boston, uh, the English for New Bostonians, which is a, a nonprofit that does incredible uh, sort of language uh, building uh, competency and particularly uh, has developed a course around English language competence for uh, small business owners. They have made a, a longer term commitment to the East Boston neighborhood based on the work that we just did there. So the idea is to build up what's on the ground for the businesses and not just, uh, uh, I guess, snatch and run. So trying to think through what that means over time and what that will mean at the end of our, of our run in, in Roxbury in the spring. Well, I, I think too in East Boston, Mattapan, and um, sort of the Dudley area of Roxbury, there are Main Streets programs right. that would be, I think would be an opportunity to create a more sort of sustaining relationship right, in, in sure. a little bit of a different way than the Main Streets programs do that. Um, I would also say not to get off topic, but just something um, I think is really important to remember through all of these conversations when we think about 
creating and stabilizing small businesses in, across our city right. is the gentrification effect uh, that small businesses are facing, similar to right. the housing crisis, uh, the cost of owning and operating and sustaining a business over time is getting right. more and more expensive. So as we create these opportunities for small businesses to do business with the city, we're helping them grow, but then also making sure through that, you know, depending on what the contract is or does, and the length of that contract and the terms of payment on that contract, that we're um, supporting small businesses through that to get to that, right. to get to that contract moment, but then also to sustain their business after after the the um, the contract expires. Right, and you're exactly right. This has been an issue in terms of ongoing conversations with property owners in these neighborhoods, and we have brokered a few of these conversations directly around how pro how do property owners think about uh, their future planning for current tenants who are small businesses, as well as some tenants that they want to attract, and how can the city help them think through affordability. So you're right on with that. And the Main Streets uh, uh, executive directors have been critical for those conversations, as well as anchoring the small business center work. So thank you for calling yep. them out for and sure. And then um, also just being sensitive to the to the sections of the city that don't have a Main Streets program. Yeah and making sure that we're paying maybe a little different attention to those business districts um, or parts of the city that have businesses that don't, don't necessarily have that, that uh, support through a Main Streets program. Yep. Okay. Thank you, that's Thank it you. for me. Thank you, Thank Chair. You. Thank you, Councilor Anissa Savvy Judge. Um, that will conclude questions and answers from my colleagues. Uh, now is the time for public testimony. If there's anyone here wishing to offer public testimony, you may do so now or forever hold your peace. Seeing and hearing no desire for um, additional public testimony. Um, we will start to wrap up. So I'm going to defer it to uh, my colleagues and lead sponsors as to uh, tomorrow uh, is our last session. So uh, mm -hmm. we have what's called matters recently heard where I can pull a matter from the committee. I'll obviously allow the lead sponsors to make a decision as to what the council's action will be or at least what I'll sure. present to the, um, to the whole council. But so you guys may want to have a discussion at some point there okay. as to um, if guys are completely comfortable with the document in its current form with some of the changes that we've made that mm -hmm. will have to uh, come out in a new draft but um, so that's something that uh, you guys can have a team back on and uh, let us know and then I'll defer it to my uh, to my colleagues the lead sponsors so so there's nothing else further to add uh, from my colleagues um, with respect to docket 1325 an ordinance promoting equity in the city of Austin contracts the community of government operations is adjourned